We are back, the Terry and Jesse show. And as we've entered into the nine days, the nine day celebration of Our Lady Guadalupe, which is huge. This is huge in Mexico, in Hispanic parishes. But I'll tell you what, she's really the, she's really the Lady of the Americas. I mean, the Blessed uh, Our Lady Guadalupe, this miracle is is uh, is something that is widespread in the Americas. It's basically changed North and South America, and it's given us this, this uh, incredible Marian devotion that everybody should be proud of. We have two authors that have written a book on this, so I want to welcome Joseph, Julian, and Monique Gonzalez. Welcome, my friends, to the Terry and Jesse Show. Hi, Jesse Hi. Romero. Thanks for having us. I appreciate you guys being on and you guys have written a book called Guadalupe and the flower world prophecy boy. Oh boy. Uh, I'm glad you guys did this because one of the things about our lady of Guadalupe, I just, I just have a feeling that she's going to play an important role before the second coming into Christ. And, and maybe we'll develop that a little bit later, but let me ask you guys, uh, what makes your book on Guadalupe different from other books that have been written? Because uh, there's there's dozens of books on Our Lady. What's particular about your book that would make it different? Uh, and why should people, you know, be want to read it? Well, only we explain it is most people know about the Tilma, and there's been a lot of books analyzing the Tilma that speak about that. Also, there's other books that talk about the millions of Christian indigenous conversions that happened in the 10 years after the apparition of Guadalupe in 1531. Also, people know about the narrative, the the, the encounter between St. Juan Diego and Guadalupe. Uh, in our book, we, we really state that that's just the tip of the iceberg, mm. that those are the things that people know. But beneath the surface, there is so much more. And it we'll, we'll talk about it later, but it basically breaks down into two things that probably people have never heard of. Number one is Flower World, which deals with the uh, disciplines, scholastic disciplines of archaeology, anthropology, and linguist. Takes us back to the cradle of, of, of American civilization. It's a belief system. It's a belief system in, in a floral power, uh, paradisal afterlife realm, and we can get into wow. that. The second thing that's born of that is what happens later, centuries later, is the idea of Nahua philosophy. Mm -hmm. Now, the Nahua were the people that spoke the Nahuatl language, which there were many different groups around the time of the conquest. We're talking around 1521. Uh, but there was a whole idea of flower and song and flowers that come down from heaven so that the singer poet can gather them in their tilma and present them to the lords and princes. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's kind of a little thumbnail of, of why our book is different. You know, one of the things that did open my eyes years ago to the to the time and place that Our Lady of Guadalupe appeared when I watched Mel Gibson's movie Apocalypto. And I'm at, in college, I'd read about the Aztec culture and the cannibalism and and some of the horrible practices that the infanticide, the sacrificing human beings on the temples and the pyramids. But kind of watching it in that movie, I'm like saying, man, thank you, Jesus, that he sent his mother to go fix that place because boy, oh boy, it was, it was a culture of death. So, so yeah. you've used this word, uh, you know, Guadalupe flower world prophecy. What is the Guadalupe flower world prophecy? What is it? Well, basically what it is, is we're saying that there's a previous story that exists and it, we've speculated it could be up to 3000 years old. Wow. And it sounds just like a Guadalupe story in so far as you have someone looking for precious, holy, sweet flowers. And he is told to go to a mountain to then gather these flowers in his tilma and then carry it down the mountain as a message of happiness and joy to the princes and how that connects with the Guadalupe story is it's obvious similarities. Right. But also in the beginning of the Guadalupe account, when St. Juan Diego, you know, he's traveling down South towards Mexico city to take part in the sacraments. He, when he passes by the hill of Tepeyac, 
he swept into this paradisal realm. And there's a ton of descriptors talking about these radiating stones and the light and they're singing. He's, he's moved into an environment where he's surrounded by music. And his first response when he encounters it is, could I be worthy of what I hear? Which is a very key line, which we'll get into in a moment. But then the second thing he says is, could I be in the place my ancient ancestors spoke of? Oh. The flower world paradise uses an exact term the flower world paradise in Shoshit Lalpan and Tonakaut Lalpan in the land of heaven. So the moment he says in his first words, he identifies as flower world paradise. He ties himself to this ancient indigenous belief system, which we now know goes back at least 3000 years. So, you know, it's called, flower. it's called flower world. And Joseph was starting to talk about how we know about it. And it's a recent inter interdisciplinary studies that go back only about 20 to 30 years. Because this is all new scholarship, what they're discovering. And this flower world, it was first discovered through song poems through the American Southwest. They started finding out that the indigenous, whether it be the Hopi or the Hoho, Akama, the Shoshone, the Comanche, they're all talking about this flower world paradise. So they started to ask questions. What is this flower wall paradise? How is it that all these different people are talking about the same place? They're using the same descriptors. And then in the process of doing that, um, they, they discovered that, the, of course, that the people of Mesoamerica also had song poems talking about the same place. They're thousands of miles away. So it opened up this whole school of study that they started asking the archaeologists to go a little further and say, are we right on this? Is this something that we're just noticing it's a coincidence or is it real? And so when the archaeologists took it and uh, started studying the different archaeological ruins throughout Mesoamerica, they started realizing we're all talking about the same place and it's in different periods of time it's in the it's in the beginning of mesoamerican civilization in 1500 bc it's in the mayans it's in the teotihuacan it's in the nawa people so that's kind of how we know about it and joseph will probably want to jump off that and so, run so let it. me just I, I know we just threw throwing a lot of information, information out you guys are connecting in my mind how mm -hmm. the, this flower world how it's tied to the guadalupe narrative that's what you guys are doing right now right Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. This is all the background to inform so we can understand the Guadalupe narrative better. Right. So we so we have flower world, this ancient belief system. It's it's it was discovered through these song poems, mm -hmm. but it relates to this earlier song poem that we were talking about. The one that the sing the singer who wants to gather flowers in is Tilma. Mm -hmm. And the experts actually tie it to that. But what we are doing is we're saying there's an obvious connection between this ancient song poem and this whole genre of poems called flower song poems or Aztec flower song poems, as it's referred to. There's an obvious connection to the Guadalupe narrative because we just brought up one quick example. This one. When Juan Diego identifies this place in Xochitlalpan, in Tonacatlalpan by name, and you find that exact same place in all these so-called Aztec flower song poems, uh -huh. where they identify the exact same place by name. And describe so, it uh, so that, with that, words and everything. That's kind of a, an initial premise of our book. You know, it's interesting. This is all, uh, you know, my, my the synapses are starting to pop in my brain because now I'm starting to understand uh, you know the the flowers on the tilma, the flowers on her actual on her actual you know mantle and her dress, the, all all the flower figures, uh, give give flower give roses to the bishop. Everything about this app, this apparition is tied in with flowers, and now you're making the connection that this this goes way back in history, way yes. beyond that that particular fifteen thirty one apparition. This is tied back to that culture, which goes back maybe even centuries, correct? absolutely. Mm -hmm. so so what we're saying is that essentially, you, we what we find in flower world are kind of two major concepts. One of them is the flower world paradise that we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. The second point is the flower is the dominant sim symbol. Now, the everyone quickly, yes. the, the flower is basically a transcendental symbol, a connection between heaven and earth through this thing called the four directions, four, four cardinal points. Uh, a, a flower is super, a four petaled flower is superimposed on this to give the connection that there's a vertical point that, that emanates from the middle of this, which is a connection between heaven and earth. 
But more importantly is that, of course, there was polytheism, pantheism, human sacrifice that we can trace through history and really reached an apex when the Franciscan friars and when, you know, uh, uh, Cortez and everybody arrived in 1519 through 1521. But there was a transcendental idea that undergirded all of this that a lot of people don't know about. For example, the bloody wars that was taken out between the Aztecs, or more correctly to call them the Mexica, was actually called the Flower Wars. And the Flower World concept was actually to get sacrificial victims so that they could turn into butterflies and, and hummingbirds and they could go up to heaven. That's kind of the philosophy underneath it. And I know it's, it's a lot, but what to sum it up quickly is that it is by this means that kind of God snuck in, so to speak, a, a, like a crack of transcendental beliefs that eventually turned into these song poems, which eventually were fulfilled through the Guadalupe narrative. Fascinating. I've ne I've, I'm pretty well read in Our Lady Guadalupe. In fact, my parish that I go to is Our Lady Guadalupe, but I've mm -hmm. never heard, I've never heard this angle that you're coming from this whole Guadalupe uh, flower world prophecy. This is new to me. And this is, this is, this is good stuff. So you're saying this is pretty recent scholarship, correct? Yes. Yes, it's almost fortuitous. You know, the whole yeah. Guadalupe, uh, excuse me, flower world premise was, was started in 1991. The understanding of uh, it. A, a linguist named an anthropologist named Jane Hill, mm -hmm. actually from the University of Arizona, she published a paper called The Flower World of the Old Udo Aztecan. And it, it hit the world, you know, scholastic storm, world like it was yeah. by storm. And it's really started this whole life idea of kind of reinterpreting Mesoamerican history through this concept of mm -hmm. flower world. As well as all the pyramids. Yeah. Yeah. I want to continue this conversation, but people are texting me. They're asking me, where can I get the book? What's the website? <laughs> to get the, book? the book's called Guadalupe and the Flower World Prophecy. And we're right now in the Novena to Our Lady of Guadalupe. This is a perfect time to buy this book and really shore up your interior life and understand this at a deeper level because the Guadalupe apparition affects all the Americas. Where can yes. people get this book? You can find it at Sophia Institute Press, but you can also find it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Pretty much everybody's selling it right now, so you can find it almost anywhere. But yes, Catholics, yes. Go, go to Sophia. Uh, you got to support yes. Catholic. Yeah, go to sophiapress.com. Uh, make, that, make that your first choice. Support Catholic apostolates, uh, Catholic book, book publishing companies. How does the Aztec flower song give the background context for the Guadalupe encounter? I know you're talking about it, but go deeper into it. Yeah. Okay, so we already brought up two concepts, the flower world paradise as a paradisal afterlife and flower as a dominant symbol, a transcendent connection. The flower is a symbol for a transcendent connection between heaven and earth, okay? So later on in the centuries, um, you know, we're talking about 1500 BC right now, but as we kind of move into the Nawa area era, we're now about, you know, 1300s, 1400s, we see a lot of these poems and they're referred to as Aztec flower song poems. It's a genre, okay? And there's a lot of things that you find in common with them, but there's one poem in particular. It's called Origin of the Songs. Origin of the Songs in Nahuatl, it's Huica Pecayot. And it has a specific narrative, which kind of sets up the rest of these flower songs. So Monique, Monique's going to briefly mm -hmm. give you the narrative to that. Got it. So the way the way the story goes is at the very beginning of the song, you have a singer and he kind of represents every man, all the people of Mesoamerica. And he starts off saying, I, I contemplate within my heart. Um, where can I find the good, sweet, holy flowers? So over the course of this narrative, he's asking the hummingbirds and he's asking the butterflies. He's asking all kinds of birds. And a hummingbird steps up and said, I will lead you into in Shoshitlalpan and Tonopah, the flower, flower, the flower paradise. of paradise. So when he goes into this flower paradise, it seems as though he sees these bright, shining, radiating flowers of immense colors and that are singing in an environment that's completely singing. And upon seeing them, he supposedly gathers him in his tilma. They actually use that term and, mm -hmm. and, and wants to run down to share it with the lords and the princess to make them happy. But what happens next is, is kind of sad. He discovers he didn't actually go there. He either had a vision, who knows, but he, he had a glimpse of it, but then it was taken away from him. So the moment it's taken 
taken away from him, you find him kind of lamenting and saying, I wish I could go back there. I want to get those flowers. But how could I, who is worthless and who sins on earth and is afflicted, obtain these flowers and go to the flower world paradise? And thankfully, within the next couple of lines, we have a solution for that. And the solution, he says, if only the God of far and near in Tloke Nawake can make one worthy of these flowers. And so the story ends like a, a half of a hero's journey. He doesn't quite complete the quest. He doesn't get the flowers. He's crying out. But the song ends with him saying, I'm craving, I hope one day, I can make it to this flower world paradise where I can be filled with the aromatic smell of these incredibly precious flowers. So it ends on a lament. So in a sense, what's really good is it, it seems like it sets up the Guadalupe story where, Gua, where Juan Diego actually finds the flowers that the previous singer didn't find. So that's kind of what we're dealing with. And, and what uh, we're basically saying, and uh, you know, th that this is kind of a defining myth of Mesoamerica and, and people have said, oh, this just sounds like a kind of a silly story. But these myths are very important. These are archetypal. These are the way that people see themselves. themselves yeah. This is a paradise lost story, which is very common in pagan stories. It's a way that pagan man was able to explain the fallen world in which he lives in. It, it's it's archetypal, it's all it's over forward. the place. But the <laughs> yeah. thing is, is that a, a, a paradise lost story Cry, cries out for a paradise gained story. Right. So what we're saying is that the story of, of Juan Diego actually finding the flowers is an overarching hero story, which if you're into mm -hmm. Joseph Campbell and kind of the mm -hmm. mono myth and all this other stuff, which so many people have proven, you know, Jordan Peterson talks about all these mm -hmm. different people talk about it, that these myths are so important that if you place the earlier poem with the Nicomachean the story of Guadalupe, it reads as one story. It's part one. Is it and all the Guadalupe one? story is part, part two. two. It sets well, it up that. because, as yeah. you said, Juan Diego starts by saying, I'm in this flower world par paradise. Am I worthy, worthy of what I'm hearing? Why would he say that? Because the previous poem talks about the singer wanting to be worthy to go into the flower world paradise. And there's another kicker, another kind of spoiler alert. We just told you about the God of far and near in Tloke Nawake as being the only one who can make one worthy. Well, well, in the Guadalupe narrative, what do we find? We have Mary coming forward and she identifies herself. And at first she says, I'm the mother, the one true God. Um, but the, the next thing that she says, she gives four terms that are very specific to the Nawa understanding of one supreme God. And very specifically, she says, I am the mother of the God of far and near. And Tlokinawake. So she's tying herself directly with these old ancient song poems herself. So if you were to put that all together, if you look at the earlier poem and the and the account of Guadalupe, Mary, is, our Virgin Mary is the mother of the one true God of far and near in Tlokinawake, the one who makes you worthy, worthy to enter the flower world paradise. Which is how it would translate for the ancient. If you connect the two stories together. Wow, yes. fascinating. So what you're doing right now, you're basically ex explaining the role and the background and the context for the conversion of the Aztecs or, or uh, the indigenous the Indians, people of right? Mexico. Th th yeah, this is this is the context to the mass conversions because they made these connections, correct? Yes. Yeah, they we, well, that's the premise. That's the you know, it, it's it's a way to explain nine to ten million, million. conversions, especially uh, with the population, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, it was a true. It's it's considered the largest Christian conversion event in the history of the world. So we're we're saying, of course, the tilma is the tip of the iceberg, but we're hopefully we're providing more context, more backstory as to how these conversions would have happened or why yep. and why. why? Yeah, what you're doing, what I, what I hear you saying is you're connecting the Tilma to the flower world, which precedes 1531. It goes way back to Aztec songs, to the, 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 the there's these poetic Aztec songs. There's a connect, the Tilma's connected to all of that, correct? Absolutely. We're, we're saying that the Tilma is, is, is part of a larger kind of artistic Expression. network. Um, so, you know, the, the, and that was, what's so 
interesting about the Nawa way of perceiving philosophy is they did it through the arts. These mm -hmm. song, these were actual songs. These were performed Dances. with dancing and with uh, log drums that called a wewet or a teponatsli. And they would have been memorized and go out from village to village and would have been kind of copied like a meme. But mm -hmm. the, the, the songs were actually meant to give an emotional impact in the same way that you experience beauty mm -hmm. and how beauty, you know, like Ratzinger and, and, and uh, Pope uh, Benedict XVI talks about this, that beauty is so important because it wounds you. It, it can give you a glimpse of eternity, whether you're listening to it or as we are, we're musicians, composers, we participate in that creation. Uh, and so so we know all about that, uh, that place that you go to as, as a performer and as a singer. So the thing is, is that that's important because it can give you a glimpse. And the Nawa philosophers, what they used to call them the Tlamatineme, mm -hmm. they try to make this transcendental connection through beauty and through flower in song, which is called in Xochit in Quicat. That was the mean that they contemplated uh, divine things. Through, through singing, through the composing of songs, uh, truth and heaven were contemplated. Exactly. And it was through that, as we've said before, it segues into the, the Guadalupe herself is actually using a lot of these same terms. Uh, we, and we outlined that in our book. She says, ponder this, uh, Juan Dieguito, ponder this within your heart. I mean, she is echoing so many things from the earlier song poems. And from the culture and the belief system, she's echoing it. So the entire Guadalupe narrative. And, and also the New Testament, those words are like very New Testament words that Jesus speaks, what you're just saying mm -hmm. right now. There's, there's Absolutely. Whole... There's a lot of parallels you can draw. You know, we, we feel like we have to set this up. So in chapter two, we go into prefigurement, typology, symbolism, metaphor. Mm -hmm. We go into the concept called preparatio evangelica, evangelical preparation, coined by Eusebius in the second century. How this setup has been done all over the world. Mm -hmm. And we posed the question right from the very beginning, mm -hmm. why did it not happen in the Americas? Mm -hmm. So uh, that's how we set up our book. And we pretty much outline how God did it here. Why is it so important for there to be a, a, a pilgrimage site at the Bayek proper? What is it about the Bayek that's so important to this whole story? Well, Tepeyac Hill was a place where... Um, Pagan worship did happen. In fact, the Franciscan friars kind of complained about it, specifically fr Friar Bernardino de Saun. And um, it, it it caused a lot of problems and actually a lot of controversy from the get-go. But mm -hmm. as we know, uh, the, 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 the Catholic Church and Christianity baptizes and actually sees a lot of times these pagan uh, concepts as preparation for the gospel message. It's kind of it's kind of those things that if we see mm -hmm. God, God's message is universal, of course, it's going to be seen everywhere. Uh, it, we're going to we're going to have hints of it everywhere. Mm -hmm. And we don't necessarily go into that point. We go into the uh, idea of true myth and other ideas as being implantations of, con of pagan ideas. Well, of course, we bring up many others, but um, but that's uh, that's where we go. But but specifically the, the the importance of bringing of having a pilgrimage site, it is because it created a locus. It created a focus mm -hmm. of people being able to come together. In fact, in the very first document written in 1556, it's called Informe, Infor, Informaciones de 1556. In for, in for, uh, uh, it was a juridical information document dated in 1556. It was legal. It specifically talks about Spanish women and Nawa, the indigenous Nawa, going Coming to, together. to ask petitions at Tepeyac. It, it was it was a, a big deal right from the very beginning. In fact, it became such a big deal that alms were given. And they didn't know where the alms would go to. That was actually that started the fight. That started this controversy. That was just one of many things that happened. But we distinguish in our book the importance of of creating a a locus a pilgrimage site, 
as different from the conversions, but we won't get into that. Yeah. Okay. But, um, but anyway, I, I, I that's, that's kind of opening, uh, ask, I think we're, uh, at, uh, answering your question. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm looking forward to getting into the syncretism part too. Absolutely. That's, yeah, well, that's, 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 that's the big question. That That's the big question, but you've mm-hmm. kind of answered it because you quoted, you quoted Vatican II where it talks about that. There are kernels of truth or elements of truth and even the pagan religions, you know, because mm-hmm. God, his message is universal. So God has been trying to coax or woo the pagans into the fullness of truth, which is a Catholic faith. So I, yeah. I get that. But but kind of explain that a little bit deeper, because some people may be concerned about syncretism, the this amalgamation of, of two religions that are probably mm-hmm. incompatible. I think that's kind mm-hmm. of a, a generic definition of syncretism. So how would you respond to that? How could this not be considered syncretism this whole flower world prophecy Mm -hmm. well just to start with even though the flower world prophecy it's pervasive throughout the americas basically what we're saying is that once those understandings and beliefs were put in place especially the whole idea of Enfloca Nawake being making people worthy of the flower world paradise that they want. It's like a little bridge point. It's an indicator so that when Guadalupe does come along, it's it's not staying stagnant. The whole point is that you can't stay where you are as a pagan and gain the flower world paradise. Something has to change. Something has to be obtained. And what needs to be obtained to get it is worthiness. And in their pagan model, they didn't have that worthiness. Right. And and so when you're going into Juan Diego as a baptized Christian, all of a sudden being able to have access to that flower world paradise where previously people couldn't get to it, there's a lot that's being translated there. It's basically, it's pointing towards baptism. It's pointing towards Christ. And then when you have Mary coming in and encapsulating that and saying, I'm not the mother of Quetzalcoatl. She doesn't say that. She doesn't say I'm the mother of Huishli Lopochli. She says, I'm the mother of the one true God. And then she uses terms that are very specific to the one supreme God as they understood it. Because even though they were polytheistic, they did understand that there was an overriding principle that was guiding and directing everything. And they had names for it. And she identifies herself as the mother of that entity. Very specifically, who, mm-hmm. which eventually gets translated as in Tlokanawake is Jesus Christ. Right. And if, I, if and if I may add to that, if, if I think one of the biggest pieces of evidence that shows that it wasn't syncretism mm-hmm. is when you look at the conversions yes. accounts, mm-hmm. they were clearly get, bringing their pagan idols to the priests to burn, to mm-hmm. smash them. They were giving up things like polygamy, slavery, things that were actually economically beneficial to them. They were denouncing it. They were going back to their first wives. They were actually paying restitution to their slaves, their previously owned slaves. And giving up properties that I, they felt that they had gotten from unjust means. So prior to Our Lady of Guadalupe, they were resistant to the Christian religion and they weren't giving these, these things up. They were hiding their idols behind altars. They were doing all kinds of things to circumvent what the Franciscans were telling them to do. And then all of a sudden she shows up and they change their mind. It it clearly shows that there was a complete shift in their understanding of what was true. Whereas prior they were hanging on to the pagan ways after her appearing, there's multitude of accounts showing that, that they clearly understood what they needed to do. Right. And and, and I would say, you know, we call it the rebranding argument. If now you have this Aztec goddess that that is now supposedly rebranded as the Virgin Mary, the Blessed Virgin Mm -hmm. Mary, is that going to cause an authentic conversion? Especially a sophisticated It it doesn't seem like it. So it was clearly in the story Pointing to, and, and Monique just showed one, pointing, yeah. pointing, offering people a bridge that they could cross over to the authentic Christian faith so that they can become baptized. And boy, did they want to become baptized by the millions by the because they wanted friend. the flower of truth, which is brought up from the earlier song poems in this ancient belief. And they wanted to enter in the, into the flower world paradise for all eternity to live with their creator. I'm just kind of curious. I mean, I've seen it all my life. The 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 Aztec dances, uh, mm. uh, were, was that like their liturgy or was it like a peace offering or was it like a war dance? What are the Aztec or, or do they have different meanings, different dances, different meanings? Well, this is where it gets a little complicated because 
because dance was part of it from the very beginning. But it was number one, it was never in church. It was always in the plazas Mm. outside of the church. And it comes from a tradition. Oh, this is a long story. It's an ancient church. It's called the Conchero. I'm going to have to have you guys on again for just that one, okay? (laughs) Yeah, let's not not go down a rabbit hole. Because that's, yeah, that sounds like it's a, it'd be a good topic to talk for about, you know, about two or 30 minutes or something. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so what's the message of the Guadalupe encounter in light of the flower world prophecy? prophecy? Basically, what we always come back to is this whole idea that God is in control of history, that the whole Guadalupe narrative is a reminder to us that when God is bringing us to the gospel, he often prepares us for a long period of time. He lays all kinds of indicators and then all of a sudden, pow, it all kind of happens in one moment. And then at that moment, you understand why God laid out all these little breadcrumbs and all these little indicators. So the book is basically, it's laying out a quite a few reasons that people could hang on to so that they could trust this Christian God and know that he wasn't asking them to give up their culture, but instead to take it and use it to, to propel into Christianity. And, and, and so we can see the dark times that we're living right now. Why isn't God doing that right now? Why isn't he Absolutely. preparing us like he did for the Mesoamerican people? So God is in control of history. God is always at work. Amen. So how does the Guadalupe world prophecy relate to other Marian apparitions? If you can make it quick, we got about two minutes. Oh, sure. Well, it's definitely the first of the Marian age. It's, of course, as we know, it's the only one that God himself gave us her image. All the others are artistic renditions of of Mary. Um, There's quite a few different things, but this one, 100 percent is rooted in the culture of the people that um, received that particular message. So that's, that makes it unique. And, 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 you know, and as we're saying, it was huge. It was, it was the biggest uh, Christian Mm -hmm. conversion and we're just outlining it to the best of our ability in the Mm -hmm. book to show all these breadcrumbs, all these things. And and it's different. It's, it's kind of different from the Fatima or Lord's, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, message, mm-hmm. but uh, we're saying it's it's just fantastic what happened. It's wonderful. Yeah, it has its own prophetical element like the others do. Yeah, um, this one this one is left physical evidence versus just eyewitness testimony like the others. There's mm-hmm. physical, tangible evidence. So, how can we apply its meaning today? The 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 message of our, our Lady Guadalupe. Well, I would say that that you know. Mary, you know, is continuing her role as the messenger, the vessel to bring people to Jesus Christ. You know, of course, we she she also has the rosary. She wants us to pray the rosary that we we know. She wants us to give all our put all our trust in her through the message of Guadalupe to know that even in the case of you know disease or war or plague or all these different issues. She's the, she specifically said she she said, I want people to come to this place of all ancest ancestries. Mm-hmm. So it's, she it's, does say that she does actually say that in Nahuatl. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it, so Guadalupe, the Blessed Virgin Mary is for everybody. So we need to just put our trust in her, put our trust in Jesus Amen. Christ. Amen. And to know that things uh, in, in the end, her immaculate heart will be victorious, especially Amen. in the dark times, especially. Yep, like now. Hey, get the book, family. Guadalupe and the Flower World Prophecy, Sophia Press Institute.com. Guadalupe and the Flower World Prophecy, Sophia Press Institute.com. I'll have you guys on another time, and we're going to talk about the whole dancing and liturgy and culture. I'm I'm kind of fascinated to pick your brain. You know, I want I want to sure. understand certain things that I probably can't. I'm just too short-sighted to see. But thank you very much for coming on the Terry and Jesse show. You guys have a blessed Holy Advent, and uh, and uh, we'll see you real soon. Okay, thank, thank you, you, Jesse. Really appreciate you. it. God bless you. Bye. You got it. You got it.